Hello there and welcome back to the Closet Historian and back to my sewing room for another project. Today I have a rather simple sewing project for you but in a fabulous fabric and with an epic sleeve. Now this is actually a shirt you've seen from me <clears throat> before. I'll be using the exact same pattern from this shirt that I made last year. I can put a card up to this video so you can see how I made this pattern the first time. I will be modifying it a little bit today because I want to take the original sleeve and just make it epic. Much much larger, make a giant ballooning bishop sleeve so I can feel very poetic and romantic while swanning around in a silk version of this shirt. But before I could dive into the delicious silk, I needed to modify my sleeve pattern. So I'll show you what I got up to over on the blue patterning table of doom, as always. What exactly is the difference between a shirt and a blouse anyway? You know, you can have a cotton blouse and you can have a cotton shirt and you can have a silk blouse and a silk shirt. Um, I guess the level of blousiness, but it's not like all shirts are fitted. I don't know. Anyway, I'm going to take my sleeve from la last pattern. Of course, in the card, you can find a link to this original video where I make the rest of the pattern. But I'm taking my original shirt sleeve here. I'm going to trace a copy onto a new piece of paper, and then we can flare this to our heart's content. As you can see, the shape is rather straight right now. So it's basically just uh, the size of my arm side, and then the sides are straightened down to the hem. But let's go ahead and draw in the center and then draw in parallel lines two inches away from the center. I'll put two lines on either side of my center mark. Of course, that center goes from my center of my sleeve cap down to the cuff in a straight line. But I will just mark this as epic sleeve and I'll draw in again two lines either side. And I end up taking a half inch off of the hem here because I was thinking, I think this sleeve's a little long. But in the end, uh, I should have left it on. And you'll see I adjust this a little bit and add a little bit of length later. So, you know, I uh, don't know what I was thinking there. Longer, bigger, that's the deal. Uh, I'm going to draw just a small indication over here because I need to remember that this is where my like opening flap plackety thing needs to go so I can add cuffs, that button, for this sleeve. But otherwise, let's start cutting up these lines to the uh, sleeve cap here so we can flare this outward because we're just going to add in a bunch of flare here. Now, one thing to keep in mind here is that fabric is only so wide, um, which I was not keeping this in mind, but in hindsight, one thing to keep in mind is that fabric is only so wide. So if you want to cut this, uh, you know, you have to make it fit on the fabric and or add a seam. So don't make it too wide. Uh, unless you want to have it be seamed, which is fine. Also, you can cut this into very many pieces to have even more giant sleeves if you want. But this is about as max width as I could make this. But on this front side, uh, where I put in two lines towards the front half of the sleeve, I'm going to add in four inches to in each of those splits. And I'll also add four inches here uh, along the center. This I put, I cut up the center line as well, and I added four inches there as well. So I've already added 12 inches in over there. And then here in the back two piece slits that I added, I'm going to add in five inches between each of these little slits. So a little bit extra even in the back because the back is where you want it to be the most billowy. I'm just going to add in five inches at the hem there. Of course, that tapers up to the top of the sleeve cap just by nature of how triangles work. You know, again, some geometry is happening here. Am I aware? No, but I'm smoothing off that hem like so and cutting off all the extra pieces of paper. I'll tape down a lot of these floops in the back just because I don't want them to get caught in anything and rip, which can be very irritating. But here's a giant sleeve. <clears throat> the hem of this is uh, pretty gargantuan, honestly. And it's so funny because it looks huge, but even this sleeve could have been more epic, I'll admit it. And the only other change I made to my shirt pattern from last time, again, this is just that same shirt pattern from that other video. Um, the only other change is I added a half inch to my shirt cuff just because it was a little tight around my wrist and I just wanted a little bit more room there. And then I did dip the back of the sleeve down again an additional inch where those five inch sections are. I added on a little bit of paper and dipped that down an extra inch. But that's the only modifications I made to this pattern in general before I dove into this Dupioni silk. This is the color Dragonfly from Silk Baron. It's their 54 inch wide Dupioni. And I had to lay out my pattern pieces like this on three yards to be able to fit all this in. And this is on gray fabric because I made a gray one too. <clears throat> but just cutting out all my pieces from that silk. I of course need two of my collar pieces so that I can uh, line it in itself. Hopefully that makes sense. And then I cut out the back yoke, the sleeve placket pieces, the cuffs, and the collar all out of a lightweight fusible interfacing as well to be able to fuse onto the silk just for a little bit of extra structure and also for anti-fraying properties because this Dupioni being a more like, I don't want to say rugged, but like raw-ish kind of silk. Um, it has large slubs, it has larger threads sometimes, and so it's a little bit, it's not loosely woven, but it's 
uh, a little bit more naturalistic in the way that it, the fabric is made. And it has lots of slubs and different things going on, inclusions, I guess, flaws in the fabric. It's not like a taffeta where it's like perfectly smooth. So it does want to fray a little bit more. So I wanted to go ahead and uh, stabilize some of the pieces and then surge whatever else I could. Um, Cause this doesn't uh, mind being surged at all. So that was nice. But I'll just take my front pieces here and mark my darts on those. I do have just a side bust dart on my front and that's the only dart in this shirt pattern, I suppose. Um, you can do move this dart anywhere you want. And actually my favorite place to switch these into is to move them up into the shoulder and use them as gathering instead, which we may be doing something a little bit more similar to that later into fall. But for now, I will just keep it right where it is. I just wanted to see what this shirt would look like in silk with a bigger sleeve, honestly. So I know this is a bit of a simpler project today, but I hope seeing as the fabric is such a gorgeous textile that will make up for the, the repeatness of the project. But I'll go ahead and pin those darts and set that next to my machine. I will sew those darts before I serge the side seams of these, but the back doesn't have a dart. The back has a yoke that we will have to contend with, which is very easy. I say that as if it's difficult, but it will be no problem. And uh, I kept the yoke back here with a little bit of gathering because I knew that gathering and puffs in this two-tone fabric were going to be really fun. The threads going in one direction on this fabric are like this peridot green. Then the threads going the other direction are kind of a uh, orchid purple, sort of a red-toned purple fuchsia color. Absolutely stunning, especially once I turn my green light on it over here. Mm, even better. But I will go and take all my pieces that I cut interfacing for and go ahead and melt that, melt that right on there. It does feel weird to use fusible on such a nice silk, but you know, it gives it a little bit more stability for the areas that need it, including my cuffs here. And then all the little pieces to do the cuff, um, what's it called? Placket. Yeah. I keep losing the word placket in my brain. If you watch my other video on making the original shirt, you've seen me do these plackets before. I don't use my own method for this. This is a method I found on a blog post while looking up how to do this. I will link that blog post below. It has the, like diagrams for these pieces here. The slits are five inches long. And then these little pieces are like seven inches long. I forget. They give you the exact dimensions in that blog post though. And I highly recommend it. It's very illustrative on how to do this. And this is the most complex part of this sort of project um, of any kind of shirt sleeve like this, where it has, instead of having like, I don't know, an elasticized cuff, like my peasanty shirt does, this has a proper button cuff, um, even if it's a narrower cuff. And, um, as such, it needs to have these plackets that open to make that accessible, I suppose, but it is a bit fiddly to do those, but I'll show you the whole process today. And here are my stand collar pieces. And again, I'm just going to interface those and then I can pin them right sides together because I'm going to sew the top edge of this in order to self line my collar. And in doing so also, I'm going to not sew that last half inch next to where it will be sewn to the neckline edge, which again, you will see later, but over here on the serger, I can go ahead and run through my side seams for those for both the back and the front pieces. And then the shoulder seams as well. It doesn't do anything to the silk and it will just make sure it doesn't fray. Of course, you could use French seams. Um, you could do Ryan seam binding or various other seam finishes to finish those raw edges. But we all know if you've got a serger, why not just put it to use? Unless you are a true couturier, but we all know I like speed. So <laughs> the serger is very fast. And over here, just sew that collar, like I said, set that aside. And I can sew the other stuff sitting here next to the machine ready. Like those darts from earlier. And I'm just going to curve off the point of the dart just a little bit here at the end, Ooh, just to help that uh, dart be as nice and curved over the bust as I possibly can. Just give that a press over my Taylor's ham over here. If it wants to cooperate, come on, buddy. There we go. And I just tied off the ends of my dart as I usually do, as you see me do all the time here. But there's that in this iridescent green fabric. As you can see, it's green and purple. Really, it doesn't get much better than this. And I was asking to see if anyone knew of any um, multi-chrome eyeshadows that are this exact color. And I don't mean purple with a green shift. I want them to be mostly green with a little bit of purple on the side. And I think the closest is probably uh, from Cleona Cosmetics. It's the color Verte um, or Vert. Verte? I think it's Verte. Um, and it's a little bit more of a um, like emerald green though. It's not this peridot green. I want peridot green, like straight on the color needs to be peridot green. And then when I move my head, you need to see orchid purple. So again, if any of you know this exact multi-chrome out there, and I'm talking like indie brands, you know, Kaliano doesn't have this exact shift, I don't think. 
and neither does Divina or Terra Moons. I'm not sure that anyone has this exact Peridot to Burgundy. Not Burgundy to Peridot. You know what I mean. Yeah? You, you kind of know what I mean. Anyway, I'm starting to do my placket here. Um, the outside, the fashion side of the fabric, gets a two inch wide piece of interfacing done along the center front there, and then it gets folded a half inch and then one inch again. This again is the same way I did it on that other shirt, um, but it does feel again strange to do feasible interfacing like this on the outside of your shirt. Feels wrong, but I promise that is how it needs to be done to support those buttons and buttonholes later on. And then here I'm doing two lines of gathering stitching along the top of my shirt back in order to gather that down into the shirt back yoke. And this yoke is just like a subtle curve, but of course you can do a different shape yoke very easily in the back if you wanted to. But again, just look at this fabric <laughs> once you start gathering it and it has that iridescence. <sighs> I kind of want to make curtains out of this fabric now. I'm thinking like a totally jewel toned, like jewel beetle of a bedroom in this colorway with like bed curtains even made out of this fabric as well. Or like doing dark, dark purple velvet curtains and then doing this as a curtain underneath. You know, multiple layers of curtains. <sighs> I just think it would be nice. Not that I dream about decor or anything, <clears throat> as we know I do. But I'll just make sure this fits down. You saw I matched up my centers of both of these, the center of the back piece and the center of the yoke. And then I'm just going to spread those gathers out, make sure that they are evenly spaced as much as I can. And then the sides of this are kind of smooth, but the gathering is kind of focused on the center. You could pleat this instead if you wanted to. Um, you don't have to have all this fullness here, but of course it means that I can tie the shirt in the front too if I wanted to have a different look. Um, wear this more billowy or less billowy depending on how I want to tuck it in. Things like that. So this doesn't actually have a ton of gathering in the back. It's not too bad, but enough that we can see that purple shine on the sides, which is the most important part, of course. But I'll just stitch that down over here on the machine. Still using my 12 inches, 12 inches per stitch. 12 stitches per inch. Gosh darn it. Every time. 12 stitches per inch is the stitch length. It's about a, I don't know, on the small side of medium length of stitch. And then I'll just put a couple of clips in that just because the yoke is so stiff now with this um, fusible on here. And then I'll press my seam allowance upward and then I will do some top stitching to hold it down on the inside. So I'm just gonna do some top stitching along the curve of this seam. Of course, using uh, orchid purple thread on this would be nice, but I did just use the green that the machine was already loaded with over here. I didn't really want to make this a standout accent. I just wanted it to be more functional as opposed to decorative, but you could of course use a decorative stitch back here. You could do embroidery on a yoke like this and it'd be very fun. You could do a contrast color on the yoke, of course, or texture, or like layer lace over the yoke if you wanted to. All good options. But now that the back is constructed together, I can go ahead and pin along my side seams, the fronts and the backs, and then hit the camera apparently, bit of an earthquake there, and then pin the shoulder seams as well, so I can sew those over on the machine. Again, half inch seam allowance. As is usual, you can see how much this fabric wants to fray when you're looking at that bottom hem there. So I didn't surge the hem. I knew I was gonna be turning it twice, and so I was just hoping to sew the rest of this fast enough that I could get to the hem before it started fraying too terribly. But look in the corner. It's like a orchid slash eggplant purple. Oh, it's so pretty. This is just the best, the, mo the most fun textile I've worked with since working on the Mandragora gown, that's for sure. It's just so freaking stunning. But I can press open those seams and then do the other side. I did do one at a time, kind of rare for me. This fabric is very slubby, by the way, so if you uh, don't like a natural silk, it's probably not the one for you. Go for a taffeta instead, although well, that would be very puffy in a shirt like this, and not the most comfortable, honestly. Um, let's go ahead and clip my curves of my collar here. So then I can turn this right side out, get rid of all my confetti that I just made. Goodbye. But turn this right sides out. You could, of course, understitch something like this as well. Uh, this interfacing was probably a little bit too heavy of a weight for this. Um, I think it's it's classified as a lightweight interfacing, but I don't have a ton of different interfacings lying around. Um, someone actually commented that recently. They said, you don't tend to use interfacing and yet your, your projects still work. Why is that in some ways? <laughs> Seemed to be the unasked question there. And that was just because most of the time I use firmly woven fabrics of a medium weight or more, so I can get away with not having to do a lot of interfacing in life because of, I guess, the techniques I use and the patterns I use. Oh, I'm turning the top of my placket in on itself, which this means this corner right here between the collar and the placket is going to be an area of vulnerability in this project, um, or in this particular pattern, 
You could make the collar longer so that it will overlap like the placket as well, or just finish this in different ways, uh, add a facing up here before you did this. But I just usually like to top stitch over that little corner. Um, but this time I'll show you, I'm just going to do a little thread tack in a contrast color of thread to make it almost like a little bit of an accent as well as a strengthening area. So I'll show you that in a minute. But for now, I'm just pinned, matched up the uh, center back of my collar area with the center back of my collar itself and then matched up the front and then I'm pinning in between just respacing that as I need to to make sure this fits nicely. Of course, the collar edge is a lot more straight than the shirt edge. The shirt edge is a lot curvier. So we're pinning something straight to something curvy, which is never the most fun thing ever. Uh, but you can see I'm just folding the front edge of the placket in on itself a half inch to finish the top of that. And that will all get held down by top stitching in a minute here. But for now, yes, that is an area of vulnerability. I plan to take care of it. Do not worry. I just like the way it looks in the end. So. You can do as you wish, of course, as I always say. But today I'll just be, this is the one spot I will be using a little bit of orchid purple thread just to do a little thread tack later to secure that area and make it into a bit of an accent as opposed to um, an area of vulnerability, as I keep saying. But over here on the machine, I can go ahead and stitch that collar on now that we're all perfectly pinned. You can see I'm like wiggling the fabric around with my hand just to make sure that I'm not getting any tucks or um, like little tiny pleats on the shirt side of this as I go around because it is easy to get little tucks in this because again, that straight edge to a curved edge, not always the most fun thing ever. And this will need to be clipped later on before I push all this seam allowance up into the collar itself to finish this area. So here we are, collar is on. I'm just checking to make sure I didn't get any weird pleats. Please tell me I don't have weird pleats, but yes, I'm just turning that, the inside collar section under a half inch, pressing everything up into the collar and pinning that into place. So I'm just tucking all this up inside, folding this side under a half inch, and then I can pin it in place and I will hand slip stitch this shut so that nothing can be seen from the outside. Uh, you can also just top stitch this from the outside. When I was doing my more rugged cotton shirts, I would just top stitch, top stitch this from the outside. It's hard to say the words top stitched. Okay, please forgive me. Um, but again, I will hand stitch this today because I thought a cleaner finish would be nice in this silk. We're really just letting this silk shine because, I mean, it wants to. Look at it. But yes, I'm just grabbing little stitches right above the stitching line of the collar and then up into the folded edge of the collar lining, down back into the collar, pulling taut but not too taut as I go along, and just finishing all this nonsense by hand. And then I'll just tie off my thread and everything and hide the ends inside the collar. The collar is pretty strong here. Usually I only interface one side of the collar, but I did both this time just because I felt like the silk was thin enough that I could get away with using a lot of crispy interfacing. So this, again, this little corner where these, the placket and the collar meet, usually I do top stitching along the collar, come down and then do the top stitching on the placket all in one go. So it kind of adds a bit of strength here. This time I am going to do something else. Um, so I'm going to stitch the placket top stitching all on its own without interacting with the collar at all. So again, I'm using the edge of my presser foot for this. I'm gonna go like a box around the placket here, which of course secures the placket to the top of my shirt like it is. Once again, if you wanna see me do this again, maybe a little bit slower um, the first time, I guess, over in the shirt video that is linked in the card. But I'm gonna come across the top like this, leaving the needle down, coming around the corner. Then I'll do the other side here. And I'll do the other side of the shirt this exact same way as well. I am using the green thread again on this green fabric so it kind of blends in here. I didn't want this to be an accent particularly. I almost thought about doing this with like a double placket so you can't see like a hidden button placket, but I decided I didn't want to fiddle with that. And then just here between that little, I don't know, inner interior corner, I'm just going to do a thread tack running through it like, I don't know, 10 or 12 times until it was a thick little tack of purple thread in this area so that it would be secured, but also a little bit of like a accent, I guess. You may not like it. I think it works quite well for this. It looks good on either side too, which is nice because I can fold this collar back if I want to, like so. So here's my finished collar placket area. Well, we still have to do buttonholes, but that will come later, like so. And then of course, it's time to start thinking about sleeves. And this is the part that takes a while. So again, highly recommend that blog post. It's linked in the description below. You get these two pieces here. 
the narrow piece always goes towards the narrow side of this. And I make my slits about five inches away from the underarm seam. Of course, my sleeve is giant here, so keep that in mind. And then this is supposed to be five inches long, but I'm gonna make mine four and a half um, this time, just because, again, the sleeve is giant. So as soon as this cuff is open, there's plenty of room to get my hand in and out of it. So I wanted to make this a little bit narrower. I'm just gonna mark that again, parallel to the underarm seam with some white gel pen. I've also marked on this little piece, the quarter inch seam allowance I need for this piece. And the most nerve wracking part of this, cutting the slit in the silk. It's like, you know, if I do this the wrong way, I can't do it. I can't cut out another sleeve. <laughs> and this is on the, I'm working first of all on the inside, the wrong side of the sleeve. And I'm gonna put this little piece here. You can see I have the wrong side up. Everything at this stage of the process should be wrong side facing up. Unfortunately, the Dupioni looks the same on the front and the back, so you can't tell that I'm on the inside of the sleeve here. But yes, inside of the sleeve, inside of this placket piece, I'm gonna go ahead and stitch this down a quarter of an inch along my slit. This is the uh, fiddly part. It's not hard, you just have to go slow and focus. And then the other part of this placket, again, the dimensions for these are in that blog post linked below. Um, I'm going to pin on the other side of our slit here. And again, I will stitch this down across the top of that little box you can see here I have drawn in gel pen. I'm gonna stitch uh, and backstitch across that top bit to secure this down. And then stitch down the other side of this slit here. This is not the easiest thing to explain, so hopefully you can see what's happening, as I always say. Here we go. Backstitching across the top of this box. Then I'm gonna leave my needle down in the corner. Boop. Press your foot up, turn the project presser foot back down, stitch down this other quarter inch seam here on this side so that we have these two little flaps on either side of our slit. Like so, and you can see that the slit ends about a half inch before the top of the box, and that's because we're going to cut into the corners of the box little clips, bloop, and bloop to make this little triangle. Of course, don't cut through your threads. Cut right to the corner, but not through it. And then we're going to iron on the right side. This is the correct outside of my sleeve now. We're going to iron this triangle flat and up like so. We can start constructing the rest of our placket. So I'm going to grab both sides of these really, but we're going to start with the narrow side. Flip that up. I'm going to press the seam allowance towards the rest of the placket like so. And then I'm going to press this edge down a quarter inch like so. Fold that buddy back just over that thread stitching line from the first line of stitching on this side of the placket. Pin that down and we're gonna stitch that right along that fold, just covering up our stitches from earlier. So this gets pinned right here and eventually the top of this will be covered, so don't worry about that as much. You don't have to sew to the top of this, um, you kind of just sew from where the box on the other side begins down to the hem. Get this to behave a little bit here, hopefully without fraying too much. Stay, thank you. And I'm just gonna flip this other side over just to get it out of the way so nothing gets caught or out of whack. I'm just gonna pin this up out of the way for now while I stitch the other side. Stay over here, thank you. And again, stitching right along the edge of this as best I can to stay, stay on target, if you all know the reference. <clears throat> and uh, stitch right along that edge down to the hem of my sleeve, like so. And then this other side, once again, press the seam allowance towards the plackety bit. And I'm going to press this side down. Ooh, look at this fraying. Get out. Stop it, please. So close. All right. Press this quarter inch. I mean, this is like three eighths, but whatever. It's not going to matter. Anyway, <laughs> so now this gets, again, pressed over so that it just covers the stitching, like so. And we have about a five eighths. I guess, with a little placky placket, which will cover everything. So this gets, this folded edge gets stitched down again, just over the stitching line. And then I will fold the top. You can fold it just straight across, or you can fold it into like a little pointy like house shape, which is what I will do today. Try and get this to cooperate. So up here, I'm gonna trim this a little because these are a little bit long since I made my slit only four and a half inches instead of five, but fold each side of this at an angle under in on itself until it wants to behave and just give that a good finger press and a good press press hope it behaves pin this down and then I will stitch this side down as well and we will have 
a finished opening into the sleeve. What an idea. This is the most time-consuming part about making shirts or blouses with sleeves like this. By far. I'm sure people, I mean, all men's shirts have plackets, and I'm sure the people who make clothing, like, commercially, can do this so quickly and so precisely, and yet for me it's like a several hour operation to get one on each sleeve correct. I can't even imagine how many they do in a day, and I can do, you know, two sleeves in one day is it's a big day for me. Back over here on the machine. I'm stitching from the hem this time, along the edge. Like so. Up around the corner of my little folded bit, which holds everything down inside. Then This again is like an eighth of an inch away from the outside. Down the other side of the triangle. And I'm going to come down to like where the end of that box on the other side originally was. Maybe. Come on. There you go. Down. And I'm just going to sew straight across here. And you can, this is again another good opportunity for like embroidery on the top of this. Or you can do different stitch patterns. Some people put an X across the little house up here. Depends on what kind of shirt you're making. But there's my finished placket. Oh. <sighs> Sigh of relief until you realize you have to do another one. Dang it. The inside is not as gorgeous on mine as the outside. But what really matters is functionality and that the outside looks good. That's right. Give that a press. And then it's time to go ahead and sew the underarm seam of this sleeve. So I will line that up. Go ahead and pin that real quick here. And then stitch it over here on the machine. Feels easy breezy after that placket nonsense, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Thank you. A relief. Just to sew a normal seam. A bit less nerve wracking. I'll go ahead and press that open. Then I will put in my two lines of gathering stitching along the sleeve hems from one side of the placket to the other. This is the largest stitch length on my machine. And I can gather those down into the cuff. But before I can do that, I will suffer through having to do the other placket. It's not really suffering, it's just nerve-wracking. And then over here, I'll do my gathering stitching for both sleeves as well. So I can put my cuffs on. I like to finish everything about the sleeve before I put the sleeve and the shirt together. So like the shirt is mostly done, and I want to get the sleeves mostly done before I put them into the shirt. Hopefully that makes sense. It's nice to work on them separately. Especially if like anything were to go wrong, you know, at least I have... <laughs> separate bits going on here and I didn't ruin the entire project and hypothetically you can get more fabric but you know dye lots and stuff not the best if that has to happen barring emergencies anyway I have my cuffs here I'm gonna fold those half inch half inch along the long sides and a quarter inch in along the short sides just how I do my cuffs for these these are again quite a narrow cuff on this um, I've done thicker cuffs on my shirts too this is just like a one button cuff as opposed to a two or three button cuff I thread got a little bit tucked Come on, behave. There we go. I'll just gather all of this down. It's about 50 inches or more, this um, sleeve at the bottom. So it's quite a lot of fabric. Luckily, silk is quite thin, or this silk in general is quite thin. So it gathers down no problem. I basically just have to gather it to the full extent it can be gathered. I don't really have to space my gathers out because it's just like compacted in there. Um, so it's quite tight. But then I'm just going to pin that gathered in, right sides together with my cuff. This is the sleeve turned the correct way out. And then the cuff is being stitched right sides on top of all that gathering. Hopefully my gathering stitching is not being weird. Behave. But just make sure everything's flat. Nothing is getting tucked where it shouldn't be. Everything is kind of spaced out. Turned almost almost into like cartridge pleating. It's so tight in here. That's all right. I've ever done cartridge pleating. Looks very intense. But over here on the machine, again, the ends of this cuff hang off about a quarter inch beyond the sleeve so that it can be folded under, which you'll see in a moment. But I can stitch all this on. Luckily, my machine has no problem powering through tight gathers in strong silk like this. Because, of course, the 99K is a powerhouse and she can do anything. And I have great faith in her. The uh, iron machines. Again, I always uh, recommend these. You can get them for just as cheap as a like entry level plastic modern machine on like Craigslist or sometimes even at like antique or thrift stores and uh highly recommend. You might have to fix them up a little bit, grease what needs to be greased and such, but if you're a little bit more DIY minded like me, no problem. They're powerhouses to work with. You see me sew over my fine white pins all the time, never had a problem on this uh cast iron buddy. Love that 99k. But yes, I'm just turning all of my rest of my cuff to the inside now and since it was pre-ironed into shape it's all ready to go and I can just again slip stitch all that down on the inside for an invisible finish so that it looks like this 
Like so. Again with our iridescent silk. Oh, it's just so pretty to look at. Don't do a bingo card where it's like, how many times did she mention the silk being stunning in this video? It's not a drinking game, okay? But yes, I need to put a line of gathering stitching along the tops of these sleeve caps as well. Just like the center five inches or so because I need to gather it a tiny bit just to cup the edge of the sleeve cap before I set this into the shirt. Um, again, it's not to be gathered, it's just so I can cup this a little bit like that. Usually sleeves have a little bit of extra built into them for this reason, just to give a little bit of ease over the sleeve cap so it rounds over the shoulder quite nicely. When I set my sleeves, I like to match the underarm seam to the side seam on the bodice of the project, or the shirt in this case, and then uh, pin one side up to the center and like the center of the sleeve and the shoulder seam and then pin the other side and adjust as needed. So that's just kind of my method for this. But I will set my sleeves into this shirt, of course, stitch those on, and we will have almost a finished shirt. The most nerve wracking part of this is, of course, that lastly, I will have to do the buttonholes. And if the buttonhole machines decides, uh, if the buttonhole machine decides to eat my project at that point, I will be out a newly made silk blouse, so I would be sad. But spoiler alert, everything works out today. <clears throat> I wouldn't give you a tragedy here on YouTube. Not about that. We're supposed to be a distraction from the bad things. This is where pretty silk lies, you know? But here I am setting that sleeve in, half inch seam allowance as usual. Again, I have my hand like inside the project to make sure nothing is getting tucked where it shouldn't be. Then I'll fill that sleeve with steam, push my tailor's ham in here. I got an extra thread from the gathering. Get out! There we go. But this is my sleeve cap all in. I like to press my seam allowance into the sleeve on something like this. So that's what I'm doing here. Give it a little bit, little bit more steam. And my first sleeve is in. I can go ahead and do the other one. And the nice thing about having the cuffs all done and stuff like that before I put it in is this sleeve is completely finished at this point. But alas, one sleeve will not do. We have to do another. But then I finally decide, let's hem this buddy. <laughs> so at the bottom of the shirt, the bodice of the shirt as it were, I'm going to go ahead and turn this a quarter inch and a quarter inch again. And then I'm going to hem that by hand, off camera. I decided to use these sort of antique brass buttons here. I'm only going to do a few. Where I put this button here, because I only did three buttons on the front of the shirt, because I'm going to wear it tucked in most of the time. And I'm not going to wear it all the way buttoned up. And if I wanted to, I could always put a brooch at the neckline. So I'm marking the first button is like directly between the apex uh, marks on my bust. So like it's like directly between my bust to keep that closed. Because you know how usually in like when you go to buy shirts and you're a larger busted person, usually it'll be like a nice gape where there's no buttons right between the bust. Because who the heck designed that? I don't know. Not a person with a bust, I'll tell you that. So I like to put the first button right between those buddies and then figure out everything else around it after that. So I just did that button that was right between the apex at apex level. And then I did a button that was right above where my waist was going to be when I tucked this in. And I did, I figured all this out by trying the shirt on, you know, there's not an official measurement for this. I mean, there's an official measurement for each person. So I could like write down, but like, meh, I'm just going to try it on each time, figure it out, especially for three button holes. It's not that dramatic to figure it out. But this is the Singer 99K button holder attachment that I like to use over here. I went around twice this time. Sometimes I go around three times. I felt like this was thick enough. Um, I did a sample buttonhole, of course, in a piece of sample fabric. But yeah, I just have a button that's a little bit above where my waistband and my skirt will be when I tuck this in. I did a button between the bust, and then I just found one more, like, equidistant between the two, and put one there. And then, of course, the last buttonhole I'll have to put on my cuffs. So I'll have three on the front of the shirt and then one on each cuff for five buttons total, you know? But yes, don't we all love seeing this weird little dinosaur of a machine work? It's a, a, a modern marvel. And when I say modern, I mean on, on like geological time, because I think this thing was invented in like the late 30s or the 40s sometime. And again, my machine is from 1955. I'm not sure. I think my buttonhole is from the 40s, but it works just fine, which is a great surprise to me because I bought it for $12 on Etsy. You can pick these up for these older machines. Any, um, I forget what they're called, like low shank machine you should work on. So give them a try. They're worth it. And then lastly for this, I'm just going to Hold my placket closed and mark in the center of the buttonhole where my buttons need to go. And I can sew my buttons on and this shirt will be ready to be worn. Though unfortunately, dry clean only.
And here is my finished iridescent dragonfly dupioni silk blouse that I very much look forward to wearing, especially here into the spookier seasons. It's the perfect sort of witch's brew, potion, poison, green mixed with an orchid purple. It's just the best color of silk ever, and I'm so glad that I ended up picking up a couple of yards of this. I did also make a dark gray silk version of this blouse, and actually this was the first one I made, and I had a few changes I wanted to make before making the iridescent version for all of you. I hope you enjoyed seeing how this blouse came together today, despite it being a bit of a repeat project. I do like to use, you know, my favorite patterns again and again, and sometimes I'd feel like I can't film the projects where I'm reusing one of my patterns because then we don't have to do the pattern drafting and, you know, it's kind of figuring ways to bring you new-ish things while still wanting to repeat my own stuff over and over again because I know what I like. So, you know, hopefully this was a little bit of a mix up with that larger sleeve. You'll have to let me know if this bothered you or if you always want to see something new. Um, let me know in the comments below your opinions on me repeating patterns from the past, you know? But in any case, thank you so much for watching today and I'll be back here with more sewing, vintage fashion, costuming and crafting real soon. So I'll see you then. Bye.